Hello and welcome to episode 273 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, as always, joined by Evan Silva. We are here to discuss the AFC. Evan, good afternoon. How's it going? Let's let's get into it. On today's show and each Tuesday this season, we do discuss each team on a team-by-team basis, highlighting the most important things we saw from a fantasy perspective. Today, we'll be doing the AFC, as I mentioned. Before we get into it, two things. If you have not subscribed to our in-season package yet, you're missing 95% of the content we put out each week. Silva's matchups, our continuously updating projections, ownership projections, all our shows, premium pods. We do have weekly and monthly options up on the site now. Check it out on the subscribe page. Second, this show is brought to you by our friends at prizepicks.com. I love player props. I know a lot of you can't bet them because you're not in a legal state. New York, Carolina. Time to move. Can't time to move. (laughs) California, Texas, other states that don't have regulated sports betting. Prize picks is legal and regulated in those states. We do have a table up each week for to compare our projections to prize picks lines on both the NFL and the NBA. We're also in Discord firing off some takes on the prize picks stuff. If you want to try them out this week, they have a 100% instant deposit bonus up to $100. Promo code ETR to get the best deal or the link in the show notes. Again, promo code ETR at prizepicks.com for the instant deposit bonus and the best deal. All right, Evan, let's get into it here with the AFC. You know, we talked about Rashad Bateman last week. I ended up playing him in cash on DraftKings and he came through with his solid line. I mean, both these games have been without Sammy Watkins that he's played, but still 20.6% target share in your first two NFL games and a mm-hmm. 7 one oh nine zero result. I mean, that's pretty good. And I would also say that given the state of the Ravens rushing game, where they have these total dust balls carrying the football, they've mm-hmm. leaned more. I mean, they've been more pass heavy than they've been in since I can remember. And so it all lines up pretty well for Rashad Bateman, I think. Obviously, Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews are also playing well. What do you see out of the Ravens? And they kind of got smashed there in the end by the Bengals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when Sammy Watkins comes back. I mean, I, I'm with you. I think that they should ride the young stud first round pick, um, but he has not played. He's been almost strictly a perimeter receiver. We haven't seen a whole lot of versatility from him so far, which isn't surprising. I mean, they, you know, it's not surprising that they're easing him in and just giving him, you know, one one role to to work on and perfect. But you know, coming out of Minnesota, he had a lot of experience playing in the slot, and you know, in in order to get him on the field along with these other guys, Watkins and and Marquise Brown, who can play inside and outside. You know, I was hoping that we might see a little bit more slot action early on. That could happen during the bye. Um, but I think that this is going to be their three receiver set. I think we'll see a good amount of Marquise Brown in the slot. I think that he will probably be the main slot. And then Bateman and Sammy Watkins on the outside after they come back and they're presumably all healthy uh, after the bye week. Um, I, I mean, I mean they, they've got a, ch- you know, with Mark Andrews there too, they've got a chance at like a legitimately explosive passing offense uh, to, to ride in the second half of the season. As long as they're going to keep, you know, running out these dust balls at RB, Devontae Freeman, Latavius Murray, when he's been healthy, Le'Veon Bell is just, he's got nothing left. Um, and not give the ball to Tyson Williams, who has been efficient. I mean, he's averaging almost six yards per carry. Over nine yards per reception, they just simply do not trust him. Um, but as long as they're running out these guys at RB, you know, these scrap heap running backs, uh, I think that they're going to continue to be a pass first team. Yeah, no, and it's great to see for Lamar too. I played Lamar in cash also, and he was really close to having a huge game. He had like a 36-yard run called back that would have given him the 100-yard bonus and put him in range to score another touchdown. Uh, I will say on Sammy Watkins, man, I mean, he's played with Mahomes, played with Lamar, and just not produced, period. Like Rashad Bateman has done more in two games than I've seen Sammy Watkins do with like Mahomes in the last like year. So whatever. Let's go to Buffalo. They come Except out of their Except for the playoffs. Somehow. Except for Sammy the playoffs, Watkins correct. Crush. <laughs> correct. Uh, Buffalo Bills come out of their bye. And look at the schedule for the Bills. I mean, Dolphins, Jaguars, Jets, Colts. It's a pretty good setup for Zach Moss going forward still i also think like we have singletary on our uh, ffpc main team where uh, leone is managing and starting robbie anderson every week but anyways uh, we do have devin singletary there and like i don't think he's that bad as a desperation option in these matchups either but i'd prefer zach moss anything on buffalo heading mm-hmm. into this soft schedule yeah i think that dawson knocks this injury to him it looks like he's expected to miss three weeks he needs surgery uh to a fracture in his hand 
What is that going to lead to offensively for Buffalo? Is that going to get Gabriel Davis on the field more? Or is it going to get Tommy Sweeney? Is Tommy Sweeney just going to jump into that Dawson Knox role and maybe end up, you know, catching some random touchdowns? I mean, random touchdowns will get you to be a top 12 fantasy tight end on the week in season long. Mm -hmm. You know, you catch one, you gain 25 yards, you're a freaking top 10, you know, top 12 fantasy tight end in season long. Um, but, or, or could it get Gabriel, could they go with more four receivers and get Gabriel Davis on the field? Gabriel Davis is a big dude. He can block. He's six, three, two, 16. He can excel in the red zone. Uh, I think that that would be, that, that will be something that, you know, interesting to watch, especially against this cupcake schedule. Josh Allen is just about to go nuts. He's, uh, he's, he's going to absolutely crush it the rest of the way. Let's go to Cincinnati Bengals. Jamar Chase, you know, he of the drops and the can't catch the striped football in the preseason is now fantasy's number four wide receiver behind only Cooper Cup, Debo Samuel, Tyree Hill. Obviously, Jamar Chase is just an incredible fantasy asset, especially as they've let Joe Burrow throw more. And Joe Burrow has been so aggressive throwing down the field. Speaking of that, T. Higgins, 15 more targets for T. Higgins in this game on Sunday against the Ravens. Now he has 43 targets on the season. He missed a couple but only 256 receiving yards. And I get that his dot has been low, but man, like yards per target for T. Higgins has been really bad. I think that's going to bump back up. Last thing I'd say on the Bengals is this Joe Mixon pass game role. I mean, you know, even with Chris Evans getting hurt, Samaj P. Ran, ran 13 routes, Joe Mixon only 16 routes on 39 borough dropbacks. So it's not great peripherals for Joe Mixon. He's going to have to get his catches on base downs. Really good mm-hmm. win for the Bengals though, down in Baltimore. What'd you see there? Yeah, Joe Burrow is number two in the NFL in yards per pass attempts behind only Russell Wilson, who was injured. Absolutely airing it out downfield. Jamar Chase has, what, like a 17-and-a-half-yard A dot. Uh, Jamar Chase, I was talking about this with Daigle. Where does he go in drafts next year? I mean, he's going to be a one-two turn guy, maybe at worst. You know, he might be a top-ten pick. It, 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 it'll be interesting to see, but, I mean, he's been absolutely sensational and I mean, it's it's scary to think because he came into the league young. You know, it's scary to think what his upside might be if he's already a top five. I mean, I think you could say he's a top five NFL receiver right now. He certainly is in fantasy, uh, and he's playing like it in real life. Um, CJ Uzoma has two games where he's just gone off, but they've come in like like on three targets. I mean, he's thirty first among tight ends in targets. I just I don't think that you can that you can rely on that. I, I think that yeah. it, it but it, it is symptomatic of just how efficient this passing offense can be. I think it's a good sign. I just I don't think you can rely on that. And then the last thing, uh, I, I'm with you on T. Higgins. I think you absolutely I think he's a buy. Eight and a half, eight and eight point six targets per game. The trajectory on the Bengals uh situation neutral uh pass rate has gone has gone steadily up. They played this the, the coaching staff deserves credit they really play i know it was frustrating early on that we weren't getting the pass volume we expected but the efficiency was there they didn't trust their o-line necessarily and the o-line has been like league average and uh joe burrow i mean no problems coming off the the november acl tear so i think the bengals coaching staff deserves credit here they played this situation perfectly from a real life standpoint, and now we're starting to benefit in fantasy. Oh, for sure, yeah. And they, I mean, they have so much talent. I mean, it, bro, God, I love how aggressive he's being. Okay, Browns. Um, this was a Thursday game. We saw Dearness Johnson just go off, and like, obviously, you know, when we say running back doesn't matter, like, obviously, it's an exaggeration. But you can see you get replacement level players like Dearness Johnson, and with the right offensive line, with the right scheme, Dearness Johnson can look. Absolutely awesome. I do think Nick Chubb is going to be back for week eight. Also, Jarvis Landry returned and I thought looked fine. It was just kind of a slow, ugly, mug, muddy game between both teams, really. What did you see out of Cleveland's win over the Broncos last Thursday? Yeah, I think Case Keenum did exactly what the Browns would have wanted to do. Zero turnovers, managed the game fine. You know, knows the offense like the back of his hand after being with Kevin Stefanski in Minnesota. My guess is that he's going to get another start. I mean, Baker Mayfield is a competitor, but they need to do what's right for him. Give him some time off. They can win games with Case Keenum, no question. It sounds like Nick Chubb is going to come back this week, but uh, no guarantees. 
Uh, I mean, and th- this is another situation where you protect Nick Chubb from himself. Nick Dearness Johnson was fucking awesome in, yeah. in that game. I mean, like, I, I was like getting hyped during the game. Like th- this <laughs> dude, you know, because we knew him from the AAF. You know, I remember doubting him initially because he ran like four eight one coming out of South Florida. He had to what like DM the Orlando Apollos uh, uh, Twitter account in order to even get an opportunity. He was good in the AAF, and man, was he good against Denver. I mean, and the O line deserves some credit, but man, the cuts that he was making, his vision, his balance. I mean, he he looked so. I, I, He's an easy dude to root for. He reminds me a lot of, I said this before, but of uh, Alfred Morris. He's not like as thick bodied as Alfred Morris, but, you know, he's a guy who really timed poorly coming out of college. He's just good at the game. Like, mm-hmm. he, you know, he, he sees the field. He knows what cuts to make. It's the exact same offense or the, the running, uh, running game that Alfred Morris has played in historically. Um, so, you know, that one cut inside zone stuff. And Dearness Johnson, man, what what a fucking stud. I, I I was happy for that dude. Yeah, no, it's great to see. And I guess my point on the running back stuff, and I don't want to get into it here, but there are hundreds more Dearness Johnsons out there if given the opportunity to produce at the NFL level, I think. And so, you know, obviously they wouldn't produce at the same level as Christian McCaffrey or Derrick Henry, but most backs are replaceable by guys that you never even heard of. Denver, uh, you know, even in a short week, Melvin Gordon outsnaps Javante Williams 29 to 21. And that was a little bit disappointing. I will say the Broncos have lost four straight. And like maybe at some point they're like, man, you know, screw it. Does Melvin Gordon really want to play for a really bad team? I don't think they're going to be really bad though. Like, you know, um, they're going to get Jerry Judy back very soon. I think Jerry Judy's expected back week eight. They play Washington football team. Like, so this whole Melvin Javante thing, it's hard to use Javante right now with his role because he's not even in the pass catching role at all. What do you see out of Denver's loss? in Cleveland last Thursday. Yeah, and uh, Judy, uh, well, actually, Fangio, right before we went on, uh, Fangio announced that Jerry Judy will be back this week. I think he's going to play in the slot. He primarily played in the slot uh, at Alabama, and Tim Patrick and and Cortland Sutton are are really perimeter receivers. So I think that that's going to be the three-receiver set with Jerry Judy inside, Noah Fant at tight end. Teddy Bridgewater's play has really curtailed as the season has progressed now, as we talked about entering that game, that was such a tough spot for him because he had, was on a short week dealing with a foot and a quad injury. he gotten hit 17 times and sacked five times in the previous game. So it, it was a tough spot for him. But I do wonder if at some point they start you know, thinking about going to Drew Locke. I'm not sure that that would be you know, a yeah. good thing for anybody, though. Correct. Okay. Uh, Houston. Uh, only thing notable on Houston is, is that Terod Taylor could return soon. They have a home game against the Rams, then at Dolphins, at Titans. I think Tyrod would give them a better chance to like, be competitive in games. I don't know that it would change their fantasy outlook that much if mm-hmm. Terod came back, though. Anything on that and anything else on the Texans? No, we could save some time here. Move on. The, the time-saving Texans. Let's go to the Indianapolis Colts. And, you know, one of my favorites from the PSM, of course, is Marley Cox. He has four touchdowns in his last four games. But, man, only 12 routes on 35 Carson Wentz drop back Sunday night. Like, I want to pick up Marley Cox. I want to play him for cheap in DFS. I I can't do it on guys who are only running 12 routes, even if they're breaking the PSM. I'd also note uh, T.Y. Hilton questionable for week eight. Big, big home game for the Colts against the Titans as we try to figure out who's going to win the AFC South. What did you see out of the Colts win on Sunday night? Yeah, I went and had pizza with uh, Robert Mays on Saturday, and we were talking about he, he has a pretty good relationship with Chris Ballard. I was like, the Colts need to go, you know, find like a vertical receiver because they, they, don't, they just have so little speed on offense. Um, I, I mean, Jonathan Taylor is like their best vertical threat, like not yeah. even just as a runner. But as a, as a receiver, I mean, he's their best like long big play threat. Michael Pittman can pl- make plays in traffic, and you know it, his chemistry has really been there with Carson Wentz. And I think that Michael Pittman is taking that second year leap. But man, they they just have so little vertical speed offensively. Mays was like, they're they're not going to do it though, you know, because uh, he hates Ballard hates trading draft picks, right? Um, you know, obviously they had to do it to try to get this quarterback. And Carson Wentz is, you know, the, the arrow has been pointing up on him, I think. 
Um, but yeah, they, they're just, they're really slow on offense. And that, that's something that, that concerns me. Yeah. JT is so good though, man. I love watching yeah, oh, JT. Yeah. I mean, freak. Okay. Uh, Jaguars coming out of their bye at Seattle announced that DJ Chark is officially done for the season. Season We suspected that there was a quote from Urban Meyer, like something about Jamal Agnew, like Jamal Agnew is the best route runner I've ever seen or something like oh that. Like, God. like Jamal Agnew is going to be a big part of this, of this offense going forward. But yeah, I don't have a lot to say about Jacksonville other than like, I'm a little wary about like guys we don't even know like stealing targets from Marvin and Chenault, but yeah, go ahead on, on Jacksonville. If you have anything. Yeah. Jamal Agnew was like a, um, in Detroit, he was like a cornerback and a, yeah. and a return specialist. And I think the quote was from urban Meyer that he's our best separator. Yeah. Which I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that he can separate, but like, <laughs> is he going to produce like, uh, but they're going to, it looks like they're going to give him targets. Uh, it's, it's very, very frustrating. James Robinson though, we can reiterate, you know, expect him to be really the focal point of the offense going forward. They, you know, although he had to overcome these obstacles and Carlos Hyde and Travis Etienne and, you know, the trust, trust of the coaching staff and the front office that didn't uh, bring him in, you know, he's done it and he's, he's a survivor and uh, James Robinson should be, you know, a, 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 like an RB one the rest of the way. Let's go to the chiefs and everybody wants to know, Evan, what's going on with the chiefs back-to-back losses. I mean, they scored three points at Tennessee, three points. At Tennessee, Mahomes got the concussion late, or maybe it wasn't a concussion. He was in the protocol, got cleared. Reed decided not to bring him back in because they were just getting absolutely trucked by Tennessee. Do you have any feel for what's going on with the Kansas City Chiefs right now? Because they look like an average team. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not even average. I mean, they got stomped by Tennessee. Yeah. I guess Tennessee's good. Right, we'll talk about them in a minute, but... um. We remember how there were like three years there where Aaron Rodgers struggled. And I remember Greg Cosell would always talk about how um, Aaron Rodgers was not playing within the the context of the offense enough. You know, you want to be a guy that can win within the context of the offense and and how the plays are designed and then be able to be a second reaction improviser when you need to be, as opposed to that being the, the crux of your game, that being the, the foundation of your game, making plays out of structure all the time. And, and uh, Greg Cosell would always point that out about Aaron Rodgers, and he's been doing that uh, with regard to Patrick Mahomes this year, um, that he's just been playing outside of structure. Like there's no rhythm and flow to the offense they don't really have a very good running game. Um, the uh, defenses play them in, in like a cover two shell to, to uh, take away big plays from Tyreek. So there's no like sustaining element to their offense. And, and defenses are taking away the big, the big monster, the moonshot plays. So that, that is, I mean, they're like a, dis, they're just, disc, they're discombobulated on offense, right? And also their offensive line revamp has not like panned out. I mean, Orlando Brown, and we talked about this before the season with Brandon Thorne, that people were all like, oh man, they got Orlando Brown. You know, there's a reason that Orlando Brown fell to the second round of the draft because he's not a good athlete and why he played right tackle in Baltimore. And now he's going to be the blindside protector for Patrick Mahomes. It hasn't been going well for him. And Travis Kelsey hasn't been as dynamic either. And I mean, oh, you know, age, age, age model, I was just going to say that. I mean, the age model <laughs> might, might be popping on Travis Kelsey a little bit. So there again, when you, when you have an extreme outcome, which I would say that this is, is an extreme outcome that we're seeing, you know, the, like the, um, the floor on the chiefs right now. Uh, there, there's a lot of reasons why it's going wrong. And, um, and, you know, there, there, there are a lot of issues. I think that they can, they can fix them quickly though. Um, I, I really do. I mean, they have a really smart coaching staff. I, I think they can get it together, but, uh, but I mean, it's ugly right now as we talk about it. Yeah. I, and also I'm not sure that Tyreek Hill has been healthy, which obviously makes a big difference. Like I'd love for them to get a buy, get Kelsey some rest, get Tyreek, get Tyreek's quad right and come back and see what they can do, you yeah. know, because it they just need is a there reset. I feel like it's later. Isn't it like, yeah, it's 12? not for a while. Yeah. It's not yeah. for a while. Yeah. It's not ideal. They need a reset. Okay. Uh, Las Vegas. One of the big injuries of the week was Josh Jacobs chest injury. Sounds like he's going to be okay. I actually think he got in a light workout. 
I read uh, early this week already, so maybe he'll be back. But I would know before you like go nuts on Kenyon Drake, Peyton Barber was a healthy scratch in this past game. But if Jacobs were to miss, Barber would almost certainly be active and play a base role. Oh, the other thing was the Waller injury. I talked about it a lot on the solo pod. You can listen to that. But yeah, I mean, Foster Moreau, I mean, my God, 66 out of 66 snaps, 32 routes on 37 dropbacks, produces the 661 on six targets. Like, man, I, I was it was awesome to see mm-hmm. on Foster Moreau and got him so low owned in DFS because the news came out so late. What you see out of Raiders, another good win for them this time over the Eagles. Well, I think you summed it up pretty pretty well. The Raiders, they're now top 10 in the NFL in scoring. They've scored in, in two games with Greg Olson calling the plays. They've scored 33 and 34. Uh, Derek Carr playing at a really high level now. I mean, trusting his arm, you know, trusting his uh, his protection, making plays in, in chaos. I mean, he has been, uh, you know, this has been his best season. I think I would say much better than the year when he was supposedly the MVP favorite, <laughs> which, you know, he's – Fucking wasn't, but you know that's what the that's what the Raiders fans think. Chargers, I don't know what to say on the Chargers. They're coming out of their bye. They're home against New England. I'd love to see them come out of the bye and prioritize getting Donald Parham involved more. Not just because like I like to joke about it, but because I think Parham actually helps their team and is really good. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I can't bet on them doing that. Anything on the Chargers as they come out of their bye? Uh, just that Mike Williams will be a hundred percent, you know, he, they yeah. limited him, uh, in that, in the week six game, uh, before the bye, he was like the number four receiver, uh, but he will be, he should be back to being the number one coming out of the bye. Miami, you know, Miles Gaskin got great usage. I would note that Malcolm Brown went down early in that game. And I think Malcolm Brown might've landed on IR, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but Miles Gaskin comes in with Malcolm Brown down. 46 out of 73 snaps. That's a season high. 26 routes for Miles Gaskin. We know he plays well in the pass game. 60% of the running back carries, 57% of the running back targets. So things are looking up for Miles Gaskin with Malcolm Brown down, I think. And they're also looking up because Tua is showing like, maybe it was, you know, home against the Falcons. I get it. It's a good spot. But Tua showed like fantasy upside. Tua, Jasicki, Waddle all playing really well. What you see out of the Dolphins game against the Falcons? Yeah, he looked great on the move too. He had a, a run up the middle where he like made a, a Falcons linebacker miss, and uh, I mean he he looked he looked really good. I mean he made a couple of mistakes in the game, but I I can't believe that people were like shutting the door completely on Tua. You know now I mean if you and I know that wins and losses isn't really a quarterback stat, but with Tua as their quarterback, the Dolphins are seven and four, and three of the losses are, are by six or fewer points. Um, so, I mean, he has been, I mean, I, I think he keeps getting better. I think he's played well in all three of his starts this year. And uh, he's targeting the heck out of Jalen Waddle. Jalen Waddle has uh, team highs in targets, catch rate, yards, touchdowns, and first down conversions on passes delivered from two. I remember they got the, uh, the shower narrative from Alabama. Mike Jasicki in weeks two through seven, remember in week one, it looked bleak for him. I think he played Mm -hmm. like 25% of the snaps or something. Weeks two through seven, he's the number three overall tight end in fantasy behind only Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey. So he has been an absolute stud uh, in fantasy this year. And I think you keep riding him again. He he showed the best chemistry of any receiver or pass catcher with Tua last year. And that has carried over into this season. I think, I, and I obviously I love Mike Jasicki. I mean, Spark and PSU and, and everything. He's playing wide receiver. And so when Devontae Parker gets back, I think we're going to have to limit Jasicki's projections somewhat. But yeah, I mean, he's playing so well. There's no way that it's going to dip in a big way. New England. Man, I thought Ramondre, and I know you did too. I, I thought Ramondre would have a pretty good role here. Turns out he like, you know, messed up in pass protection in week six. In week seven, they make Ramondre inactive. JJ Taylor is the guy who is up. I don't think that's like long-term sticky. Like we just don't know, but obviously the Ramondre stuff is very, very weak to weak. I'd also note on an injury note, uh, Johnny Smith went down with a shoulder injury. I didn't see how serious it is, but obviously if Johnny were to miss time, it'd be a nice boost for Hunter Henry. who has been scoring a lot of touchdowns. Anyways, what you see out of the Patriots? Yeah, I know the ETR account put out the, uh, you know, Ramondre Stevenson is like on the rise uh, tweet. Um, but we also talked about on the show, that Tony Romo had pointed out in week six, these pass protection mistakes that Ramondre Stevenson had. 
And there was, I mean, we even mentioned the possibility that he could be inactive uh, in, in week seven, which he was. He was a healthy scratch. And that's how this stuff is going to go. You know, I mean, that, that's how this stuff is going to go, that he's a rookie who has been making mistakes. He's looked good in, in, you know, a handful of his opportunities. But like Bill Belichick, Ivan Fears, you know, the Patriots' longtime running backs coach, these guys are not going to put up with uh, errors. You know, they're, they're not – I mean, he's just they're just going to use another guy. And that's what they did. J.J. Taylor got a bunch of garbage time stuff. I wouldn't go adding him, I don't think – I, I do think it's good news for Damian Harris, though, uh, that Ramondre Stevenson, because Ramondre Stevenson was nipping at his heels in that week six game. They pretty much shared first and second down work. And then when they pull him out, you know, that helps Damian Harris. And Damian Hill, Harris, uh, I think they play the Chargers this week, right? Yep. Chargers have like the worst run defense in the NFL, like by, by a good margin. So Damian Harris looking looking nice this week. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Damian Harris is when they get behind, though, I don't think he's going to play a ton. And so that's why Damian Harris, I thought, was a great play against the Jets, you know, against the Chargers. Obviously, they could, much bigger chance they get behind, but we'll see. Yeah. Jets. So Michael Carter really benefited. And, and, you know, I don't want to look at this in a vacuum because Tevin Coleman was inactive due to an ankle injury. Ty Johnson left the game for a while in the concussion protocol. But still, Michael Carter went off for season highs in routes run, snaps, targets. He had eight catches in the game. So it's just something to watch with Michael Carter. Like we've been talking about him since the preseason. They finally used him in like the pass catching role. And maybe that correlated with Mike White coming in. I don't know much about Mike White, but it seems like he was at least checking down to running backs more often than Zach Wilson was. Can you tell the people anything about Mike White? I think Zach Wilson's going to miss uh, two to four weeks here going forward. Yeah. In 2018, I used to write like all the, the pre-draft blurbs for, uh, for Roto world. I'd write them out like before. And, uh, you know, we just plug them in as the guys got taken. And, uh, I wrote that, uh, <laughs> Mike White was a poor man's Tom Savage coming out of Western <laughs> Kentucky. And then last night, Daigle tried to tell me that he wrote the blurb <laughs> and, and, and we, we, we date checked him and it was in 2018 Daigle wasn't even employed by Roto World. Yeah. This was the easiest uh, victory that I've ever had. And we, over, didn't, and we didn't start ETR until 2019. Right, right. Yeah, he's so, wrong. Yeah, no, he's definitely wrong. Poor um, man's Tom. That, that's, not, that's not very uh, encouraging, encouraging, poor man's Tom Savage. <laughs> right. I mean, he just came in and chucked down a bunch, you know? And I mean, look, it, it helped that I think the, the, the Jets are turning the – they're, they're pulling the ripcord on Tevin Coleman finally, right? I mean, dude, dude it's just, he was hurt, terrible. but yeah. He was I mean, hurt. Yeah. And yeah. then Ty Johnson suffered a, a, a possible concussion. Is that correct? He he came back in the game, though. I think he cleared it and came back okay. in late. Yeah. But still, I mean, okay. you know, it was, it was good to see Michael Carter get that much work. I just don't know if both yeah. Tevin and Ty Johnson are active next week. Right. That we'll see the same thing. But, we'll, but right. you know, we'll keep an eye on that. Another thing, and I, I, it, I'm sure that it contributed to the fact that there was a lot of garbage time, but. The Jets used five receivers in this game, and Elijah Moore was the three. The one was Crowder. The two was Corey Davis. The three was Elijah Moore. Then Keelan Cole and Denzel Mims, they all played snaps. So that, that's going to be a frustrating situation. I mean, I, I think it's just a situation to avoid. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Steelers. I don't have a lot to say on the Steelers. They're coming out of their bye. They uh, are playing at the Browns. We know Juju Smith-Schuster is done. You know, I have optimism for – both Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool going forward. But, you know, the days of Big Ben throwing for like 350 yards and four touchdowns, I think, are pretty much done. Anything on the Steelers as they come out of their bye? Um, yeah, I think that this is the time to buy Chase Claypool. Uh, his bye week is now out of the way. No Juju Smith-Schuster. He played a lot more in two receiver sets in the game before their off week. and. You know, I know that it's it's tough to trust Ben's arm and all that, but with talent like Chase, what Chase Claypool brings to the table and his target upside and his playing time going up, like this is a situation to jump on, I think. Uh, he's going to have some big games in the second half of the year. Yeah. Big PSM guy, Chase Claypool. Oh, yeah. All right. Last one we're going to do today is the Tennessee Titans. I mean, last two games wins over the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. I mean, pretty impressive. 
Um, AJ Brown was back for this game and playing well despite the Chipotle, the epic Chipotle battle that he had. Eight catches, 133 yards, and one touchdown. And this wasn't a game where it was like a ton of volume. I mean, Ryan Tannehill only dropped back 34 times. AJ Brown was still able to do that. Julio remains very, very banged up. A small note, Darrington Evans returned. He ran three routes. McNichols ran six. Derrick Henry ran 15. And so I'm always just watching like for this, if it's going to be sustainable, like getting Derrick Henry two, three, four catches a game, or if it's kind of was a product of Darrington mm-hmm. and McNichols both being hurt. It looks okay so far, but I think if they got down big in a game that they might go to McNichols or Darrington, we'll see. But yeah, big game for the Titans coming up this week against the Colts. I mean, the battle for the AFC South, the prestigious AFC South. Yeah. And coming off a big uh, Monday night win against the Bills and then trouncing the Chiefs. I mean, I thought the the Titans were pretty fraudulent early in the year, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're good. I, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, I, I still really don't trust their defense from a personnel standpoint. Julio is, you know, they're, and they're really thin at the skill positions. We've, we've seen that. I mean, we've seen, like, they lost the freaking Jets, man. Yeah. So, I don't know, man. What a, what a Jekyll and Hyde team. Like, they're, they're really a team that is, is hard to pin down just how good they are. But when they've got all their dudes out there, like, even if, if Julio is not 100%, you know, we've seen historically that he, his on and off splits are, like, he makes a difference just being out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, as long as they have their healthy dudes, like they're, they're, they're pretty dangerous. Yeah. All right. We've said it all about the AFC. Appreciate you all being here. We'll be back on Thursday for the betting show. And then of course, Friday night, we will be here for the DFS show with Wiggins. Wiggins is on an ultra heater right now. Stack. Oh yeah. Shout out for the monster win. Nice. All right. For producer Luke, for my sign, which if you're watching on YouTube is actually lit up behind me now. For Evan, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.